Good morning. You can take the green outline from your bulletin. Last week, we introduced our new series, When Life Doesn't Go As Planned. You can't predict the most influential events in your life. They just happen. And when they happen, you can't go around them, you can't go over them, you can't go under them. The only direction you can go is through them. Last week in part one, we introduced the six stages of dealing with loss and being grief. And you can see this at the top of your outline. We're looking at the six stages that I have adapted from the Kubler-Ross model. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, born in 1924, died in 2004, was a psychiatrist who specialized in near-death studies. That's what she did her entire career. And she came up with the five stages of loss and grief. <clears throat> now what I've done is I've renamed all five stages. And I added the stage called sanctification because I wanted to make sure that what I'm presenting is reflecting what we believe the Bible teaches. But you can see her stages on the outline and then how I have adapted them. I want to begin in Ecclesiastes chapter 9. I love Ecclesiastes. One of my top five favorite books in the Bible because it talks about how life really is. And as we look at each of these six stages in the six weeks, this week and the next five, I want to begin with this. People can never predict when hard times might come, like fish in a net or birds in a snare. People are often caught by sudden tragedy. The first reaction to any unexpected negative event usually is shock. And take a look at these four Old Testament passages. Shock is not something that's new. It's been around for a long time. In Jeremiah 5.30, a horrible and shocking thing has happened in the land. We are being carried away from our homeland. Ezekiel 3.15, I sat among them for seven days, shocked at what has happened to me. In Psalm 143, I am in total darkness, like someone long dead. I feel numb all over. You can identify with that. In Isaiah 21.3, I'm in terrible pain. I'm shocked and hurt so much that I can't hear or see. The great prophets of the Old Testament experience shock and pain. And it is very possible that you are headed into a situation that you are not prepared for. A financial crisis, you get laid off. You get the dreaded results of a, of a test and you can see you're going to be fighting for your health. A relation crisis. Someone has walked out of your life. So we have all of these different crises that come into our lives that we have to deal with. And oftentimes, the first thing that happens is we are shocked. Now, maybe you're fortunate and you're not going through anything real tragic right now, but you know someone who is. So how can you help Someone who's going through a tough situation right now. We're, we're first going to talk what we can do to help others. Then we're going to talk about some things that we can do to help ourselves. So here's some three things you can do to help a friend. Number one, these are deep, deep, deep theological. Three things. This next one is so deep. 
This is deep. This is going to shock you so deep. Number one is show up. <laughs> That's deep. That is deep. When you see a friend in pain, maybe they lost their job, maybe they're going through a divorce, dealing with disease, a lot of times you may show up, but you don't know what to say, and that's totally okay. In fact, you don't always have to say something. Sometimes it is more meaningful just to show up and shut up. It's what is called the ministry of presence. That is you just being there. Now you may remember the Old Testament story of Job. The poor guy lost his family, all ten children, in a freak accident in a windstorm that blew across the desert. He lost his health. He lost his possessions all within a 24-hour period of time. And his best friends, Eliphaz, Bildad, Zophar, <coughs> later Elihu, they heard about it. They heard about how their best friend Job was having some tough times. So it says in Job 2.11, <clears throat> when Job's three friends heard about all of the troubles that had come upon him, they set out from their homes and met together by agreement to go and sympathize with him and comfort him. They didn't wait for an invitation. They set out to sympathize and comfort their friend Job, who was in pain. Their intentions were good. Their intentions were fabulous. Now, it didn't turn out too well in the end because they accused Job of bringing all of his problems on himself. But their intentions were good. When a person is in deep pain, you don't need to say a lot of words. They don't even need a lot of words. They need hugs. Hugs. Sometimes hugs are good. Well, I don't know. Are there bad hugs? That would maybe be another lesson for another time. <laughs> so, number one is show up. Show up. Show up. You don't have to be a theological expert with all of the answers because you don't have them, they don't have them, nobody has them. Two. Second thing, share their pain. Now I thought about this, and you know I do the outline about a week ahead of time, and then I go over the lesson, and then there's things that I like to change, but it's too late because the outline has already been turned in. You could put on here, if I was doing this again, I would put sympathize with their pain. I put share their pain, I mean to sympathize with their pain. If you have a broken arm, you're hurting, not me. So I'm not sharing your pain in that sense. So probably it would be better sympathize with their pain. So in Job 2, when they saw him from a distance, they could hardly recognize him. This guy is really sick. You know, there have been people who have gone through something, they just don't look the same. They began to weep aloud, and they tore their robes and sprinkled dust on their heads. Then they sat on the ground with them for seven days and seven nights. No one said a word to him because they saw how great his suffering was. Have you ever sat with a person, maybe not for seven days, but for a few hours and not say a word? Job's friends did it for seven days because they saw how great his pain and suffering was. So I look at this and I ask myself, what are we supposed to get out of this beyond the historical event of Job losing everything? Here's my application, and you can agree with it, disagree with it. This is my application. The greater the loss and grief, the fewer words needed. The greater the loss, the fewer words you need to say. If someone has a splinter in their finger, you can talk to them for 45 minutes about how bad splinters are. They're going to live. If someone is having a bad hair day, which I never have, 
If someone's having a bad hair day, you can send them a text message and comfort them and tell them tomorrow will be a better hair day. But in the loss of a family member, a job, a relationship, you don't need to say a thousand words. It's the ministry of presence. It is your being there that encourages them most of all. The Bible says, weep with those who weep. When people are in shock, they don't need words. They need tears. And when a friend hurts, when a family member hurts, everybody to some degree hurts. So the second thing you can do is share their pain in the sense of being sympathetic. And then three is take the initiative to help. Take the initiative to help. Is there something you can do to help, to be helpful? So here's Proverbs 3.27. It says, do not withhold good from those who deserve it when it's in your power to help them. Now, doing good can mean just about anything depending on the situation. It can be running an errand. It may be bringing a meal. It may be mowing a lawn. I'm just using these for illustrative purposes. I know there are some people on their deathbed. They don't want you messing with their lawns. <coughs> they can be dying and have five minutes left. Do not mow my lawn. Because it has to be done at a certain height. And you can't just go up and down. You have to go at an angle. So I'm just using these for illustrative purposes. You have to look at the situation. And you have to determine what is appropriate. Don't say to somebody going through a major crisis, call me if you need anything. That basically says, don't call me. It puts the responsibility on them and makes them have to work in order to get your help, you are forcing them to take the initiative. I would even suggest saying, how can I help? Because someone who is in shock, in deep shock, has absolutely no idea how you can help. They are numb. They are paralyzed. Everything is happening in slow motion. They may not even be able to respond to a text message. So a few years ago when I had this accident out here, I wasn't hurt. But there were, how many, there were one, two, three, there were six pickup trucks involved and four of them were towed. It was, we were all facing north on Schillinger at Greelock. Schillinger facing north on Greelock. There was my truck, a truck in front of me, and to the side, three pickup trucks. And a person came racing through the intersection in a pickup truck and turned to go on Greelock and smashed the three outside trucks, which in turn hit the truck in front of me and hit my truck. I remember being turned. I remember being turned and all of a sudden my truck was up in a different direction on the curb. I wasn't hurt. At least one or two people had to go to the hospital. I wasn't hurt. But in a strange way, I said, well, you know, first thing, I better, I better call my wife. And the strange thing is I, could, I couldn't figure out how to get to my cell phone. I couldn't figure out the code, you know, for the screen thing. Lock screen. Couldn't figure it out. And I guess I couldn't do it. I just couldn't do it. And that, that was a minor accident from my perspective. My, and then, of course, they wanted to tell them my truck was told. I didn't want 6000 bucks for my truck. I just want my truck, man. <laughs> and so at the Kirby's, they just fixed my truck. And it's been going for seven years since then. You know, they give you 6000 bucks. What are you going to do with that for a new truck? It costs $70,000. If you get one that's worth anything. And keep it for 20 years. So... You can offer them options. You can say something like, I'm going to pick up hamburgers and chicken fingers. Would you like yours on Wednesday or Thursday? Yeah. Something like that. So take the initiative to help. Evaluate the situation because different people have different likes and dislikes. And this is somebody who's a friend. Someone's close to you, so you kind of know them. So take the initiative to help. So that's what we can do in our relationship to others. 
We can show up, we can sympathize with their pain, we can take the initiative to help. What can you do for yourself when you're in shock? Some of you may be in shock right now. Shock, depending on what level it is, isn't just something, oh, and 10 minutes later, you're fine. People can be in shock for an extended period of time. Number one, this is what we're going to do as believers. Cry out to God. Did you know that's okay? Yeah. Cry out. You, I'm glad you know it's okay. You know, you know why I know it's okay? It's in the Bible. This is Psalm 50, verse 15. It says, call on me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you. Watch this and you will honor me. And so I'm looking at this, and we've read this passage many times. Look at what it says. You actually honor God by calling out to Him in the time of trouble. How is that honoring God? Because you are acknowledging Him, and you're acknowledging His ability to make a difference. So when you call on the Lord, and I'm calling it cry out to the Lord. When you call on the Lord, you are honoring Him. He wants you to call on Him. In Lamentations 2.19, ooh, Lamentations, that doesn't sound like anything good. That's a, it's a funeral poem is what it is. It comes from the word lament, you know, a lament. So here's Jeremiah, this little companion volume believed to be written by Jeremiah. He's sitting on the ruins of what was Jerusalem. They weren't happy about that. It says, Arise, cry out in the night. Pour out your heart like water in the presence of the Lord. And so I'm reading this, I'm thinking, the reason why you're crying out at night is because a lot of times when you're in shock, you can't sleep. And you say, Lord, I'm hurting. I am sad. I am sick. <laughs> Maybe you can listen to your favorite music that calms you. Maybe you have some calming music that you like. Maybe you have one of those little music machines that does uh, waves hitting the beaches. Or maybe I talk to somebody. You know what they listen to at night on their little music box? Crickets. They said it makes them think of summertime. Well, maybe you like to listen to crickets. Maybe that's calming. Different things calm us. So cry out to God. Number two is let others help you. Now here's the point that I'm trying to make. When you're in shock, don't be too rough on yourself or too demanding of yourself. Maybe somebody who's close to you can take out the trash or help you in some way that you are comfortable with. Don't be too rough on yourself. In Proverbs 17, 17, it says, A friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. What this passage says on a deeper level is relationships are most meaningful when you're in pain. And the reason it's important to let other people help you when you're in deep pain is because your natural tendency is to withdraw, and that may not always be the thing that needs to be done, at least in the long term. When you're in shock, you may need fellowship or an encouraging word. Don't try to deal with everything yourself. The church probably is not going to be able to solve your problem, but we can pray for you. And we can encourage you. And maybe somebody has been where you are. And they can encourage you with, and give you words <coughs> of hope. So let others help you. Three, postpone major decisions. If you've just gone through a major crisis, you've been laid off, you're sick, you're going through a divorce, don't act like it didn't happen because it did. But you may want to postpone major decisions if you are able to. It may not be the time for you to say, I'm selling the house and I'm moving. I know that process takes a few months, but once the papers are signed, 
There's no getting your house back. It's not like a pair of pants that you order, and they come, and they don't fit, and you put them in a box, and you <coughs> send them back. Or you take them back to the store, if you're one of the few Americans who still goes into a store. If you, do you go into stores? Do you, does anybody go into stores anymore? I thought everything was ordered on Amazon. And when the pants don't fit, you send them back to Zappos. All right, some of you still go to stores. <laughs> this is Proverbs 12, 25. Worry weighs a person down. When you're under the pressure of worry, it weighs you down and affects your thinking ability. So just be aware. Making a major decision, you want to make sure that you have the proper presence of mind. So how do you prepare yourself for a major crisis? We had a 9-1, 9-11 anniversary a few days ago. And back at the 9-11, 2001, we were not prepared as a nation. You know, afterwards we talk about how we can be prepared, be prepared and have security as a nation. On 9-11, we were sitting ducks. We were not prepared. In the entire continental United States, there were only 14 fighter pilots, 14 fighter planes that were prepared to defend the homeland. And when President Bush left on Air Force One from Sarasota, Florida, not knowing what was going on in Washington, they ended up going to Barksdale Air Force Base in Louisiana, two hours away. For an hour and a half, there was no military escort. They were completely vulnerable in the sky. They had received threats of missiles that were going to come in. So the pilot took the plane to 45,000 feet, and the communications were basically cut off. We were ill prepared for that day. So they talk about, well, here's some things that we can do to be prepared. Living along the coast, what's the big deal with that we're always concerned about? Hurricanes! And uh, do you have your hurricane kit? I'm looking at hurricane kits on Amazon, of course. <laughs> and I found this great kit. It's a hurricane kit. It comes with a deck of cards. <laughs> Isn't that great? So, you know, the, the wind's taking your roof off, and you're you know, doing blackjack, five card draw. Look at honey, the, the roof, the shingles are coming off the heart, off the top. Now, hit me with two more, baby. Like, you're going to be playing cards during a hurricane. <coughs> so, we have a picture up here, I think. Yeah, there we are. Sometimes on the back of a watch, it says shock resistance. Now on the back of my watch, it says, it says made in China, if dropped, throw it out and return to Walmart for a new one for $11.95. So they don't all shave, they don't all say it has to be a pretty good watch to be shock resistant. So what that means, as I understand it, is, you know, you can drop it on the sidewalk or something and it's encased and everything's floating the parts and it'll, it's still going to run. Is there a way that we can increase our shock resistance? Some people are ill-prepared and never fully recover spiritually or physically or emotionally from a crisis. Now I say fully recover I mean getting to the point where you can get on with life normal to some degree. There's some things you're never going to forget, some things you're never going to get over. So a couple of things will help us to be more shock resistant. Number one is cultivate strong relationships. God never intended for you to go through life alone. I'm not talking about marriage. I'm talking about you needing a spiritual family called the church. Your spiritual family, our spiritual family, our relationship as brothers and sisters in Christ is going to outlast our physical families. Physical families don't last. People grow up, they move off, they marry, they divorce, they die. 
And so the best time to build a spiritual safety net is before the inevitable crisis comes. So in Ecclesiastes 4 and 9, it says two can accomplish more than twice as much as one. If one falls, the other pulls them up. This is why you need a few close friends. You don't need a hundred friends, a thousand friends. You just need a few quality friends who metaphorically can pick you up when you fall into the ditch. But if one fails when he is alone, he's in trouble. So cultivate strong relationships. Two is grow spiritual roots. Now you know about the tumbleweed, and I, we had a picture, but something went wrong with the picture. I had a picture of a, of a tumbleweed. You know, you've seen tumbleweeds when you watch Western movies or something. Maybe you've been out west and seen a tumbleweed. You need spiritual roots. So you are a tumbleweed that dries up and blows in whatever direction the wind is going. I'm using the tumbleweed as an example of spiritual instability. It blows this way. It blows that way. Now, by the way, the tumbleweed as a plant, oh, what a remarkable creation of God. Read about that tumbleweed sometime. It's remarkable how that thing perpetuates itself. Incredible. Absolutely incredible. The Bible gives you roots to keep you spiritually strong when tough times come. So in Jeremiah 17 and verse 8, we're going to read this passage. And it, when you read it, you may sound like, I've read this before. Yes, it's very similar to the opening chapter of the book of Psalms. Somebody was sharing notes. Jeremiah 17, 7. Psalms came before Jeremiah. Blessed are those who trust in the Lord and have made the Lord their hope and confidence. They are like trees planted along a riverbank with roots that reach deep into the water. Such trees are not bothered by the heat or worried by long months of drought, which we had for a while until what, Thursday? Their leaves stay green and they go right on producing delicious fruit. You need spiritual roots for stability. Redwood trees are the largest living things on the earth, reaching a height of over the tallest ones, over 350 feet, weighing 4 million pounds. But get this about redwood trees. They have extremely shallow root systems, sometimes no more than five feet. Five, that's from about here to the stage. So imagine a tree, super big, way around. 300 plus feet tall and a five foot root system. So, do we have a picture of it? Okay, I don't know if you can tell. That's a guy standing in front, I say six, six foot guy, standing in front of an uprooted redwood tree. And I, I, I couldn't find a picture that had a different angle, but those, they don't look like oak roots from Mobile, do they? Where like there's more underground than there is above ground. You can kind of tell those are rather shallow. So how does a redwood tree survive big, giant, 30 stories and horrible root systems? The key is they grow together in groves. And although their root systems don't go down, get this, God created them to go sideways so they interlock with other trees in the grove. Do we have our interlock picture? Yeah. Look at that. <coughs> you see those things interlocked? 
because I always want, I mean, if they have shallow roots, how are they going to stand the winds and the storms of Northern California coming off the Pacific Coast? Their roots don't go like this. God made them to go like this. And they all get interlocked. They form, get ready for this, redwood trees form a community root system. Now I think I understand why there's a, a group of churches that refer to themselves as the Grove. Have you ever heard of a church called the Grove? Yeah. <coughs> and you've seen their little symbol of the tree? And of course, the symbol just has leaves on it. I figured maybe everybody finds shade under the leaves of their tree. But maybe there's more to that in that the root system interlocks and the growth. We become a community of believers interlocked so that we are spiritually strong. I thought that picture was amazing. I thought you were, I thought I'd hear a, a gasp. <laughs> oh, my, my. That's how they stand. That's how they stand. So I want to conclude with this passage from Colossians 2 and verse 6. It says, Just as you trusted Christ to save you, trust Him to, for each day's problems. And notice, problems is in the plural. It doesn't say it for the occasional problem that comes along. Live in vital union with Him. Let your roots go, grow deep down into Him and draw nourishment from Him so that you go on growing in the Lord and become strong and vigorous in the truth you were taught. Let your lives overflow with joy and thanksgiving for all He has done. So I want to say this in conclusion. We want this congregation to be a growth. We want this congregation to be a community of believers interlocked for the purpose of love and spiritual growth and support. And if we can be like those redwood trees, then whatever comes into your life, as tough as it is, because tough stuff happens, and a lot of stuff you can't do anything about, you're not going to lose your faith. And that's what our root system is about. It's not about taking away your pain. Wish we could take away everybody's pain. But it's helping us to be strong in our faith in the Lord so we don't give up. There's this interesting passage in Hebrews 12, 2. And it talks about Jesus on the cross. How did he get through the cross? I'm talking about Jesus the man. It says, who for the joy set before him endured the cross. So you have hope. And you grieve differently from people who don't have the Lord because you grieve, but you're grieving with hope. You know, this is not the last chapter. This is not the end of the story. This is our station before we get to the eternal station in the next life. So it's okay to complain. It's okay to tell God that you think he's unfair. Job did that for multiple chapters in his 42 chapter book. It's okay to do that. But don't give up your faith in the Lord. And even when you don't know, even when you don't understand, there's so much we don't understand. Don't give up your faith in the Lord. Continue participate in our service and in our activities and then you'll be everything that the Lord wants you to be in a flawed world. Hank is going to lead us in an invitation hymn and if you have a particular need, please let us know what it is while we stand and sing. Jesus, I love